Good morning, church family. I uh, hope you're doing well. And once again, this is Saturday morning, and we'll be released Sunday morning. Uh, a couple of announcements to get out before we get started this morning, and uh, we're going to be looking at Acts uh, 6, if you want to turn over there. So, uh, you I don't know if you're keeping up on uh, the government and the laws that are kind of being tossed around, laws, guidelines, all those different things. I don't know about you, I find it very confusing. Uh, but we're doing our best to try to navigate that kind of stuff so that we can get outreaches and um, uh, discipleship, interaction, fellowship, so we can get all those things going right away. So an update on that. Um, we are going to start doing the drive-in church. So I've talked to a few different people, and I have to admit, my first response was drive-in church. Really, that I mean... To go and just sit in my car somewhere and when I can just sit on my couch online, that seems a little overkill. But having not talked to a few people, and actually we went to the Church of the Nazarene Drive-In Church, because I know Fred and Karen, they're uh, good folks. And uh, I'll tell you what, um, it wasn't probably as big of a blessing for us because we knew nobody that was there, uh, but it was cool for us to be there. Our family enjoyed it, sitting in the car. And Fred, I don't, you probably don't watch these, but it's a good word, brother. Like, we were super blessed by that. But the uh, people from the church, they were stoked, honking their horns. They just had a great time. It was believers getting together, and it was really received well. I talked to Garrison uh, up at Peninsula Baptist. He had a very similar experience up there with their uh, radio uh, church, or they did speakers. And just, just the body getting together. So I have become convinced and we've discussed it with the leadership, and, and so uh, May 24th, which will be a week from our tomorrow, whenever you're watching this, I don't know, but May 24th at 10 a.m., we'll be here at the church, weather permitting. Um, you know what? You want to come at 10, at, at, uh, 10 a.m. in the pouring rain and just see who shows up? God bless you with that. That's, and I mean that, like, show up, roll down your windows, say hello. There's some rules that go along with that that we'll cover when we're there, uh, most notably, you uh, to, to keep your windows down, you have to be six feet apart, um, and there's some other rules. And I encourage you to go find out those rules and um, so that you can uh, be subject to the government, in a sense. So having said that, we'll just do a message, um, and we'll see how it works out. And you can see uh, other people and so forth. So May 24th, 10 a.m. here at the church, uh, and we'll be doing the radio broadcast, and we'll figure out uh, the frequency and all that. We'll let you guys know as you're coming in uh, on that day. I'm trying to think if there's any other details on that. None that I can think of. Uh, there'll be more to follow, and any update we need, we'll put up on Facebook during one of the Q&As. Uh, got some good Q&A questions for this week. Um, I also just want to encourage you, it's, it can be kind of hard because it is confusing about what laws are okay and what's not okay and is, are the media covering it. So I got an email and I kind of check out the website and I want to ask you to check it out if you're interested. So Joshua Freed, who is actually a candidate uh, for the upcoming election for governor in Washington. Apparently there was a man in Bothell, uh, Washington, that was shut down trying to have private Bible study in his house, one-on-one -on -one Bible study. So uh, there was a lawsuit that took place, and uh, basically it was um, decided that personal Bible study cannot be infringed on by the government. So if my encouragement is this. If God is leading you and you'd like to, man, God bless you if you want to get together for Bible study in your home and, and have some fellowship in that. And we're, we're going to see more, hopefully, you know, phases starting also, part of that update is, so Al Fredericks, who is, for lack of a better term, the Calvary Chapel District Manager for our area um, with uh, Southwest Washington. I know he had a very brief meeting with Inslee. He was able to propose some things for Phase 2 with churches and so forth, and um, we'll see what happens. I, I think there's some federal decisions based on some lawsuits that are happening this uh, this week, I know that there's the, the lawsuits that are happening down in California. I think there's one that are happen that's happening in Oregon. Again, I'm not endorsing or not endorsing these lawsuits. I'm just trying to give factual news and what it means for us. So please don't read into what political stance that I have. I, I really don't have one. 
Having said that, the outcomes of these lawsuits are going to determine what we as churches are going to be able to do in the phases and even right away. So please pray. Um, you know, we keep meeting. We have our meeting with our elders. We're praying together and asking the Lord for wisdom, trying to figure out what we can do and what we should do. And, and really, this is the heart. And I, I don't remember everything that I said last week. If we're willing to do whatever God wants us to in our minds, <laughs> not saying it wouldn't, there wouldn't be fearful or something like that, uh, I'm willing to bank, bankrupt myself and my family. I'm willing to go to jail if need be. I'm willing to bankrupt the church and, and force us to sell the building because uh, those are the results that could happen from civil disobedience. That's fine, uh, but we're just really praying, God, is this the hill that you want us to die on? Uh, is this the hill that you want us to just take a stand and say, your word calls us to get together. This is in, you know, infringing on that commandment, on that um, uh, testimony that we have from the scripture to us that we're, be, we're supposed to get together as believers. Now, that testimony, when it was written, was not written in the time of church buildings. It was written in the time of, of meeting together in homes. So I don't, I don't think we can take that specific verse, like in Hebrews chapter 10, for example, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and then say that means you have to meet in a church building, and if you don't, then you're... you're Disobeying God and you're milk toast and you're listening to men instead of God. I, I don't, to me, that's an outlandish stretch of that, especially when in the context and the time they were persecuted Hebrews. They were Hebrews, they were Jews who got saved and became Christians, and they were being persecuted for their faith and ostracized and all these things. It was a direct attack on the individual believer and on the church. And the challenge wasn't you better go to the temple and get together. The challenge was don't stop meeting together as believers. So, anyway. I'm just telling you what we're thinking. I'm telling you where we're at, what we're praying about, and that I can give you, you if you choose to believe me or not, it's up to you. But with 100% of our hearts and our souls and our minds, we are invested in finding the will of God and trying to do it. So we'll take any prayer that you have for us as church leaders uh, or leaders of this church uh, so we can move forward in that. But hey, God bless you in where God has led you, and you know we have no condemnation, whatever you've decided. If you decided that you're not going to go out and you're you know, going to take all the precautions, God bless you in that. If you've decided, hey, I'm having a Bible study in my house and I'm going mask-free, then you know what? God bless you in that. It's, this is between you and the Lord, and hopefully as a body of believers, we can support and lift up one another. Uh, as each other has to come to, as each of us has to come to our own individual conclusion on what God has for us. So God loves each and every one of us, and He's got great things for each and every one of us, and we're only accountable for each for ourselves. <laughs> and that's it. And so if we can walk that way, I think we're going to be a okay, which is going to bleed a little bit into our text today. So if you don't mind, we're going to pray, and then we're going to look at Acts chapter 6. Father, thank you for your word, for your scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for how much you love each one of us. Thank you that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you that you have mercy and you have kindness. You have leading, you have guidance, you have promises that where people are seeking you and they're seeking wisdom, that you're going to answer them and everything's going to be a-okay. Lord, that's our hope. Lord, we can say, or at least we want to say with confidence, though you slay us, we will trust you. Lord, we're willing to die by the corona. We're willing to die by the sword. We're willing to die to ourselves on an individual basis just to see your will done. So, Lord, we pray that you would be blessed, that you would be lifted up uh, in our hearts and our minds, and that you would be able to go, f uh, or the, excuse me, that we would be able to go forward in your word and to hear you today. Lord, you're very kind, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 6. Here we go. There's only actually four people here, and my daughter has the hiccups now, so <laughs> let that be forever recorded on YouTube. So if you hear weird things in the background, it is my daughter's hiccups. All right, Acts chapter 6. Let's read the first six verses, shall we? Or excuse me, verse 7. Verse 7. Verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose 
uh, arose um, against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to do this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Echinor, and Timon, or Timon, Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So in the beginning right here, it says, now in the days when the disciples were increasing in number. So this is, Luke makes a few kind of updates to the church throughout the book of Acts. Really, one through, in chapters 1 through 9, he makes these updates. And one of the updates he continues to make is the church is still growing, right? So we don't know all the ins and outs, and we don't know exactly how long this is from the, the chapter 5 that we looked at, you know, a few weeks ago, and the, the healing, and then when they stand before the Sanhedrin, and... Then they get brought out um, and beaten, and they rejoice in that. So this is right, you know, it's recorded for us, and it's in these days. So somewhere seemingly around that same time, you have a church that's growing. It is flourishing. Great things are happening. And lo and behold, in the middle of great things happening, a problem starts. So if you haven't experienced church or you're not familiar with church, it's important to realize that this is how church works. It grows, and then problems happen. And, and we'll say more of that about that a little bit later. One of my absolute favorite Proverbs, so if you want to flip over to the Proverbs, this is probably a proverb that I think should be hung above the door, not really, but maybe kind of half-joking, of, of every single church that's out there. I forgot where the Proverbs were as I was sitting there talking. But if you flip over to Proverbs and, and chapter 14, I'm not kidding. This is one of my absolute favorite Proverbs in all the scriptures. In Proverbs 14 and verse 4, Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of an ox. We literally have a proverb written by Solomon in the Bible that says... You have to put up with bull poop to get things done. This is exactly what's happening in the church. Where there, let's read that again. Where there are no oxen, the, the, uh, the manger or the barn is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. In other words, the proverb is this. Where you don't have any animals, no labor no labor or beasts of burden, if you will, then your stalls where they would live, there's clean. There's no poop. You don't have to pick up anything. There's no smell. There's no fallout. There's no big deal. Where there's no oxen, their manger is clean. But it takes oxen, it takes work animals in order to grow crops. Now, you can have a garden without an ox, right? And many of us will go out and we will get the, our shovels and our hoes and our rakes and you'll, right? You'll, and, you, and you'll have a little garden and it's great because then you harvest your couple little buckets of snap peas and you have, you know, a couple weeks worth of, um, of tomatoes and maybe you get some corn and, and maybe you stagger your crops to make a few meals from your little 10 by 10 or, you know, whatever it is. And you have a garden and that's great and it's fun and it's, it's novel. But you're not going to eat that all year, all right? You're not going to start break the canning gear out and, and start saving up for the winter. It's not going to happen. No. And for many of us, if we get any bigger than that, what do we do? We call our friends and we say, hey, do you, do you have a rototiller I could borrow? Because frankly, the shovel and the, the, the hoe get a little bit rough after it gets to a certain size, doesn't it? And so we get out our rototiller. Well, the, the proverb is this, look. In order to have fruitful, in order to have fruit, excuse me, 
in order for lots of crops and lots of benefit and lots of good to come forth, you have to have oxen. You have to have these animals that are incredibly useful, incredibly important, and incredibly stinky and messy. And you know, ironically, how does the Bible refer to God's people the most? Well, not the, maybe the most. The most used word is saints, which means holy one. But over and over and over again, Israel, what are we? We are sheep. We're sheep. We're animals that provide wool. They're, they, they're useful animals, right? But they're stinky. They're not very intelligent. And I'm not trying to sit here and pick on the church. That's not my goal. But my point is that this is the, a universal proverb. And so we come back to Acts chapter 6, and what do we read? In a time where more and more people are getting together, what happens? Neglect. And what is the neglect based on? Their their country of origin, their backgrounds. So it's pretty interesting that when you start getting this church together, the church immediately begins to have problems. Am I promoting that? Am I, am I saying, hey, it's okay to have problems? Hey, it's, it's good to have problems? Hey, we want to endorse these kind of problems? No, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is take heart. If you go to a church and it has problems, it's okay. It's normal. Why? Because there's a bunch of people there. And what do we do when we all congregate? We cause problems. We have issues. And where do our problems and our issues come from many times? Our backgrounds, don't they? Don't we drag in life experience? Don't we drag in things that we've been taught? Don't we drag in opinions and all these different things, whether it's our politics, our view on money, our view on sex, our view on marriage, our view on how interactions should take place, our view on should we wear a mask, our view on the virus, our view on all these different things that get brought into one place, and ta-da, problems. It's unfortunate because I think many people including myself at times. I used to go to a church that was smaller, it was very small, and I, I would maybe even sometimes pride myself on that. And I've talked to other people too, and I'm not trying to put it on them, but where they say, well, I don't go to a big church because there's just all this hypocrisy. I remember asking a pastor one day, and who used to pastor a church, and, and then he switched to home churches. I said, why did you, you know, I'm just curious, you know, why did you switch to home churches? Why did you stop pastoring a church? He said, I got tired of all the problems. I got tired of all the hypocrisy. I got tired of people just not doing everything right. And so in a home church, basically what it add up to is you have more control over people because there's less of them. I'm not advocating for that. And so often we can try to retract and get away and, and try to say the, the church is bad. You know, mega churches are bad because there isn't intimacy. Well, maybe, or maybe you could get into a small group. Or this church is bad, or 200 is okay, but 250 isn't. Well, 1,000 is okay, but 15 isn't. Well, this is okay. We make up these standards and these rules, and we go, oh, we get, because there's just so many people. That's right. And there's nothing wrong with small churches, and there's nothing wrong with big churches as they're following God and be led by God. So I just love the fact that we have this proverb millennia before... The church comes along, and it tells us exactly right. When you're going to have a fruitful ministry, there's going to be bull poop, and you got to put up with it. And I love it. I just love it because it's helped me personally with so many issues in the last 13 years that I've worked through with my own self, issues I've caused, issues other people have caused. When I've said stupid things, other people have said stupid things. You know, all that just to go, hey, you know what? This is just church life. It's what it is. And we're just going to walk through it, and we're going to work through it. And that's exactly what the church does. And that's what's so cool about this. It's not just cool that they have problems, although that can be comforting for us. But it's cool that they have problems, deep-rooted problems. And, and actually, in, in some respects, these problems are going to manifest themselves for the next three decades and longer in the church. We even see, to be honest, see leftovers from these problems 2,000 years later. But they're going to deal with those problems. So what is the problem? What, what happens? Well, ultimately, this is all about relationships with one another. This is, this is all about how we look at one another and care for one another. So you have this increasing numbers of disciples. Uh, you have these increasing numbers. And then a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected 
in the daily distribution. So let's break this down a couple ways. Number one, first and foremost, identity. In the early church, they have identity that is based on, or I should say not based on, anything to do with Jesus or anything to do with the church. Notice that the early church, Luke is recording this, and there's two factions in the church, and there are two factions of Jews. So Jews are not Christians, and Christians are not Jews, right? Christ, he says, I didn't come, he says, if you take an old wineskin and you put new wine into it, it bursts. Christianity was never supposed to be like a, a morph out of Judaism. It was something that was completely new. It was the fulfillment of Judaism, but it was something that's completely new and different from Judaism in the sense that Christ fulfilled the law, and now we walk according to the Spirit and not according to the law for righteousness' sake. And as our daily guide, yes, we can see the heart of God through the law. There's, the law is perfect, right, we're told, um, and it's, it's us that are weak. But what happens here in the early churches on a basic level is you have two factions that never should have been factions in the church. There never should have been identities in the church. We know that from Paul's writing in Galatians that he broke down the wall between Jew and Gentile at Calvary. That there's no more man, no more woman, no more Jew, no more Gentile, no more barbarian, no more free, no more slave. All those identities were broken down in Christ, and now there's one new man, one new person, one new life that is in Christ, and that was created through the cross. And when a person gets saved... We become part of that. We're no longer Jews or Gentiles or slaves or freedmen or something like that. that that's not who we are anymore. We're, it's not about my, my identity as a man or my identity as a woman. That's not who I am anymore. Yes, physically I may be American. Physically I may be a man and emotionally and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, that doesn't determine who I am in Jesus. Jesus determines who I am. And that is a soul set free from sin and justified before God and free to serve God and to serve righteousness and to perpetuate uh, and build into, if I can, God's kingdom. So first and foremost about this, we see that immediately there's factions that never should have been there, identities being embraced that never should be embraced in the church, and it causes an issue, okay? So what is a Hellenist? A Hellenist is basically a Greek-speaking Jew. So you have in, uh, I can't remember the exact date, 746, it's the 8th century, the Greek empire began its rise, right? And the Greeks begin to conquer the world for approximately, the known world, that area, for approximately 350 years, right? Then you have the death of Alexander the Great, and then you have the Roman empire begins to rise up. And, and these weren't like just dates where it was like, and Greek died, and Rome dominated the world. These are things, obviously, that happened over time, but in generalities, this is what took place. The Greek empire fell, it rose and fell, and the Roman empire took its place. So in that area, you have Palestine, Israel, you know, these different areas. Most Jews from that area and most people from that area, whether they were uh, descendants of Philistines or whoever it was, they were bilingual and they spoke, for example, like Greek and Aramaic, right? Whereas other people groups from other areas might speak Greek and their native tongue, right? Whatever that might be. But when Greek conquered the world, Greece conquered the world, the known world, Greek became the main language. And we know that Latin eventually from the Romans eventually died out. So, so most of the Jews and Christians spoke um, may have spoken Greek, but that was like their, their second language. And then, but their Aramaic would have been their primary language. As a side note, it's very interesting. If you have access to uh, the original Aramaic Bible, the Aramaic Bible uh, from about 100, 100 AD, the, the, it's not the entire compilation. Well, it depends on when you have. But it's actually, the Aramaic Bible of today is traceable back all the way to 100 AD. It's pretty amazing, actually. And it's really great to bring out when you have certain arguments for people. Oh, the Bible's been translated so many times, it's just unknowable. Well, it once for the, for the Aramaic. Um, and it was really not even translation, probably just a lot of it was recording. But the, the believers, the universal language was still Greek. So what happens is you have people that became Jews in other countries that were Greek-speaking speaking countries because of the, uh, the dominance of the Greek empire, and, but yet they became Jews, so they, they, they speak Greek, 
And then they came and they got saved. So they went from being polytheists, you know, the Greek gods, to them being Jews, followers of uh, Jehovah, the one living God. And now they've become followers of Jesus. So they're, that's who the Hellenists are. They're Greek-speaking Jews that got saved and became Christians. And, well, anyway, that's who they are. So the Hebrews, well, those are Jews. And those would have been the, Amer- the primarily Aramaic-speaking people that also knew Greek because of those things. And many of them would have known Hebrew also because that was the, t- the language of the temple and it was the language of their forefathers. And many, many Jewish people uh, memorized the Torah, knew Hebrew, that kind of thing. That's, that's why you have, for example, when Pilate crucifies Jesus, he puts that sign above him in Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew to... Uh, or was it Latin? Latin, Aramaic, and Hebrew. Latin, Greek, and Hebrew? Anyway, the language is to, to, to post it up there that he's the king of the Jews. So, the Hellenists, who, would all, who, who come from, they're not true Jews, which already creates friction between Jews and, and, and Gentiles, right? So Gentiles who became Jews become Christians, and then you have Jews who become Christians. And there may have been Gentiles intermixed with this. We don't ultimately know. The Bible doesn't talk a lot about Gentiles in the church until later on in the book of Acts. So these two clear identities that people have are very much alive and well in the church because the complaint is this. The Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews who converted to Judaism, complain because their widows are being neglected in a daily distribution. So you actually, in a sense, have early racism. You have a problem in the church where the, the, some of these, these widows that are from other countries, that are from other descent of pure Jews, are being neglected in this distribution. So what is the distribution? Well, this is widely argued. Um, it's either money or food or both. And we get that from the fact that the, the word... Uh, from the word distribution, but also if you look down in verse 3, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 2, the, the, the end of verse 2 it says, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So the idea is that there were tables that were set up that the widows would come to and they would get, uh, they would get provided for. So by, for. so by review and to look at what we're looking at, we're looking at I mean, really, all the, way, all the way back from like Abraham, right? Warring tribes. You're looking at friction between Gentiles and Jews, between Greek Jews who, who converted to Judaism and, quote, the true Jews who were Hebrews. We're looking at a, another thing that the, the, the church in general at this point that we know of, they're gonna, it's, it's going to be in Acts 15 where they're actually going to have a summit where they decide whether or not Gentiles can be saved. So at this point in church history, you know, whatever it is, however many months into the church that we are, at this point in church history, they're not, there are people that don't believe that Gentiles can even be saved yet. Okay? Why am I saying all this? It's a big mess. It's a glorious, gigantic mess. It's a giant manger of oxen and their byproduct that's going on right now. And God is working, and He's moving, and he's blessing, and he's taking care of them. You know, and the, one of the cool things that you see in how this is handled, the Hellenists have a problem, they have a complaint. Other translations say a murmur. So we don't know if they took the complaint to them, uh, but it seems that the implication is, and I wouldn't be dogmatic about this, or, uh, but the implication is that they were just complaining about it, that they were just murmuring, that they were just kind of like, oh, we're getting neglected. You know, these, uh, these Jews over here, they're getting the better deal, and we're just... What's the deal? Why are we getting treated like this? We shouldn't be treated like this. We should get this money, we should, you know, however it might be. So they're upset about it. And then you have this response that comes forward from the apostles. And they begin to fix it. So there's our context. That's what's going on here. So, I, you know, there's another pretty neat context. And I'm going to go ahead and read this. If you want to first flip over to 1 Corinthians 1, because I think this can really help us to look at how God looks at the problematic church. It's so easy for to us, for us as Christians, 
for other people that have left the church to make these radical, radical accusations and expectations about the church and what the church should be and so forth. And yeah, we have templates, we have examples of what the church should be like, but we're always working towards that goal. We're not usually out of it, so or usually at it. So in 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to a church that he started. So Paul started the church in Corinth. He was there for about 18 months. Um, this is actually not his first letter to them because I think it's chapter 6 where he says, this is now the second time I'm writing to you. So even though our Bibles say 1 Corinthians, it's, just, it's called that because this is the first letter that we have. It's not the first time he's ever communicated with them. But Paul has been advised by someone in the household of Chloe, the, the scripture tells us in, here in chapter 1, that there's a division among them and that all these terrible things are happening. Paul's going to go into, when he writes Corinth, he's going to talk about um, stop suing each other. He's going to talk about stop misusing the gifts to bring your own personal benefit and attention. Stop getting drunk at your church potlucks. Stop shaming poor people at your church potlucks by, by bringing this food and then not sharing it and eating it in front of these slaves and so like that, people that would be able to come to the meeting. Uh, he's gonna, there's a man in the church that has some sort of a sexual relationship with his stepmother. And he's open about it, and the, the church evidently is accepting of that and just saying, hey, this is really great. Like, just, you know, you want to have uh, sex with your stepmother? We, we endorse this. We're an open church. You know, things like that. So I don't know about you, but if you showed up on a Sunday and went to the potluck afterwards and you saw a bunch of rich people getting all schnockered, and then you saw a bunch of poor people getting neglected and shamed, uh, if you saw people getting drunk and taking the Lord's Supper, if you heard other people saying, I'm suing that fool because he borrowed my mower and that guy and he trashed it and he didn't give it back to me, so I'm going to take this guy to court. And I'm, you would, might, it would feel dysfunctional, I think, right? Wouldn't you kind of be like, whoa, this is a church I really not, I don't want anything to do with this church. Now, for us, it's really easy, right? I, th I think there's 21 churches on the peninsula. And I mean, universally, there's hundreds of thousands of churches in, in the United States. You don't like a church, you just roll out. Forget you guys, I don't, I'm not going to call the pastor, I'm not going to tell anybody, I'm just going to leave, right? That's how it happens a lot of times. And if you've been severely hurt by a church, I'm not minimizing leaving a church. I'm just making the point that we can just go in and out, and, and it's, it's, we think it's okay, uh, even though other people may be hurt by it or, or might see it. You might be surprised. Anyway, big problems in Corinth. He's riding them to give them a gigantic spanking. <laughs> essentially, by the Holy Spirit, and say, knock this stuff off. Check out how he starts his letter. We're going to skip the kind of the normal greeting. I'm Paul. I'm with Sosthenes. So in verse 4, he says this, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Wait, what? So Paul writes to this radically, radically, radically dysfunctional church, and he says to them, I am so thankful for you. I am so thankful for the grace that God has given you. I am so thankful for what God is doing in your midst. And God's going to sustain you guiltless, continue to sustain you to be continually guiltless until the day of Jesus Christ. Wait, what? They're suing each other. They're getting drunk at church. How, what, what is this? What is, are you kidding me, Paul? What's going on? God is faithful. That's what's going on. He's writing to me. He says, this is, this is how I look at you. This is how God looks at you. You have these problems. God is wanting to work them out. He's sending you His Spirit. I'm writing you to correct you. But you have all this great stuff going for you, and God's going to continue. You're not condemned in this, and God's going to continue to work. Was it dysfunctional and hurtful? 100%. But here is Paul writing to this church. He's just saying, man, I'm so for you, and this is so great. And I tell you, friends, this is how the church has to operate. You know, in John 13, when he tells his disciples, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but in John 13, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment. It's an old commandment, but he says, I'm giving you a new commandment. It's that you love one another as I have loved you. 
And he says, this is how everybody will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. That's the key in this world. This is a loveless world. Anybody been on the internet lately? This is a loveless world. Anybody scrolled through your Facebook field, uh, feed lately? This is a loveless world. Anybody looked at the comments on anything on YouTube lately? This is a loveless world. This is a world that just destroys and bites and devours. And you say one wrong thing, or you even dare to disagree, or you even dare to have another thought, and what's ha- what happens? Absolute condemnation and judgment and hatred and vehemence. That when we actually, it's no surprise that when Jesus says, when you actually love each other, that's how people are going to go, wow, you must be from God. You must have some sort of divine thing going on because you guys actually love each other. He could have said a ton of things. He, Jesus could have said there, and I, I encourage you to flip there, write it down, underline it. John chapter 13, 34 and 35. He could have said a million things by your good doctrine, by your amazing quality sound, by feeding the poor, by whatever it might be. Those things can all be representative of love, but by truly loving one another in word and in deed and in heart, he says that's when people will know that you are of divine origin. Not that we become divine, don't twist my words, but that we would actually be have Jesus and the divine spirit flowing out of us through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. If you actually love someone, if you actually jump on someone's feed on Facebook and say, I love you, I disagree with you, but I love you, and I just hope God gives you the best for your life. Amen. I'm going to wear a mask. You're going to stand out. I'm not trying to, I feel like I'm really anti-Facebook, and I'm not necessarily, so I hope you don't just come away like, wow, James is really bitter about Facebook. That's not my heart. But if I could just be honest for a second, I've never been so grieved since I got back on Facebook a few, what, two months ago, so that we could, uh, I could do these um, Q&As and stuff. I mean, I scroll down, and it's like crazy to me. I don't really care about the unbelievers. I mean, I care about them as human beings, but I don't really care what they say. They're doing what comes naturally. They're walking in their natural sin. But when I look at believers, they're just literally trashing each other, hating each other, dominating each other, sending links and YouTube videos and you're this and you're that and you're just, you're just full of fear. Well, you just don't care about old people. Well, you're this and you're that. And I just think, wow, this is incredible. What unbeliever is going to log on to our feeds and read that and go, well, I want to follow Jesus too. This guy's super legit. I like where this is going. They go to the same church. They go to different churches. They hate each other. This seems like a very legitimate thing to me. I'm not trying to spank anybody or be mean or be rude, but man, I'll tell you what, we can get so riled. We're out there stopping gay marriage and we're out there making sure that people aren't fornicating and making, oh, we got to stop weed. We got to do all these things. But when it comes down to just being nice to each other, we can't do it. And it's a dang joke, church. It's a joke. It's shameful, to be honest, when we act like that. Taking up these giant, making sure that people don't do abortion and making sure this, that, and the other thing. And I'm with you in those things. Like, we don't want dead babies. But you know what? How can, any of us take, how can anyone take us seriously about trying to stop killing babies when we can't even talk nice to each other? I don't understand that. And it, it's so grievous. And, that, and so here we have this example of how Paul looked at Corinth We have this example of what's happening here in in the early church. Like, I don't know if there's been a time where the church was more messed up. I mean, I guess you can make an argument, well, today the church is extra milk toast, and therefore the early church was hardcore. Yeah, hardcore about not feeding old women. (laughs) This, This is a pretty substantial problem when you say, oh, I see you're a Greek Jew, even though we're Christians, and that's not our identity. But I'm going to go ahead and not feed your grandma. I would consider that a pretty legitimate and a pretty uh, bad deal, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you consider that to be a pretty offensive thing to be going on in the church? It hasn't changed. There's been ox and poo from day one in the church. So let's respond to it like these guys do. So what do they do? Verse 2, 
and the twelve. So you have the, the apostles, right? Uh, Judas is dead, so this is probably f- referring to Matthias. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said. So they get together the disciples. Now, I just want to make, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to make a major doctrinal point about this, but it's the disciples. So the word for disciple is not the word for believer. Again, I'm not going to launch off on another, I'm a free grace guy. I, discipleship is not being a believer. Discipleship is becoming like Jesus. You, you become a believer by believing, by trusting on Jesus and receiving the forgiveness of sins. You, becoming, you become a disciple by beginning to follow Jesus and making you more like the master. They're two different groups of people, okay? Uh, and we can debate that some other time. But in this case, I think it's noteworthy. It does not say, it, the Greek word here is not the word for believers. It doesn't say and they went to the believers. It says they went to the disciples. Now, am I trying to, trying to oppress or speak ill of people that haven't decided to walk with Jesus in a very real way and become more like him? No, I am not. That's not my heart. But my heart is that when it came down to finding and making a decision and what's best for the church, they didn't just go willy-nilly. They went to the disciples. So they gathered these disciples together. Did they gather all the disciples, a couple of them? I don't know. We don't know how they did it. We just know that they went to the disciples, people that were trying to be like Jesus. And if I can just kind of throw a side note out there, if you're trying to make a decision in your life, don't just go to believers. Go to disciples. When you're looking for prayer and wisdom and leadership, don't just go to be people that just show up at your church. Go to people that are trying to be like Jesus. Because very many times, it's going to be two different sets of advice. And, and, and typically, or often, not typically, I don't want to say that, but oftentimes, the disciple is going to have the much better advice because they are trying to be like Jesus. They're obeying Jesus. They're walking with Jesus. They're responding to Jesus' spirit in their heart. And they're going to give you something out of the word. And a lot of times people that have trusted in Jesus, they, in, they've, they've got saved, they're forgiven of their sins, but they've decided to kind of live their life outside of the teachings of Jesus and not necessarily endorse what he says. And the idea of taking up their cross is not something that they want to do. Well, then their advice is going to come from that place. So let's just be careful who we ask uh, and, 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 and counsel with. So these guys... They get to the disciples, they say this, It is not right that we should give up preaching and the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you uh, seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. So remember, at this point, there's no Bible, right? The, The Bible doesn't exist yet. The New Testament doesn't exist yet. The book of Acts doesn't exist yet. The book, the Gospels don't exist yet. We, you know, we don't have, they don't have a New Testament really yet. Um, what's happening is the 12 are going around and, they're, and other people too that learn from them are going uh, to different churches and they're preaching and they're beginning to write letters to the churches, right? So that's how God's New Testament word is being communicated. Mostly if you read in Acts, uh, Paul is going around and he's, he's talking about the Torah to the Jews, right? He goes into the synagogue and he'll bring the Torah out and he points to how Jesus is the Messiah. That's kind of the main ministry of a lot of these guys right now. Now, Paul's not even on the scene yet. That's three more chapters to go, but the the 12. So they say, hey, you know what? We have a church now so far that we know of, of like eight to 10,000 people in Jerusalem or more. (laughs) And there's 12 of us. So it's not a good idea for us to stop teaching the word and stop our prayer and seeking God to go and serve these widows. They don't say, hey, we don't care about widows. We're too good for that. So we're not going to involve ourselves in that. Why don't we find some other peons to go handle that? That's, that's not what they say. They say that God has called us to do this. It's not good for us to leave doing this. So you, disciples, you church, you look for among yourselves seven people that can do this job. And they say, then they give the criteria for it. The people that we need to do this job are people that are, um, where is it here? That they're, uh, therefore, brothers, pick out seven that are of good repute, so they have a good reputation. They're full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. And, he said, and then they say, we'll appoint them. So you kind of have this um, dynamic where the, the, Either whether it's a murmur or a formal complaint, the problem gets delivered to the apostles, the 12. 
they address the problem and they look back to the church. And they say, hey, here's a problem. It's a substantial one. Old women that can't fend for themselves, especially in this society, that don't have husbands, that don't have brothers, that don't have uncles in a patriarchal society to have them into their home, that are poor, as the majority of people were, are not getting fed. Big problem. So we want you, the disciples, people trying to follow Jesus, to let us, the apostles, know who you think would be good for this job. So again, this is relationship, right? This is relationship in action. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to be plugged into church, to be involved with believers, to be dialoguing, because it's your contribution in the church that builds the church up. And this is just a very practical way that this happened. And so the the disciples, we don't know how they got together, how it happened, but they come up with these seven names, and they say, these are the guys that we would like and we think would be very good at overseeing this ministry and being part of this ministry, serving in this ministry, to help these other people out. So you have the problem, you have the complaint that reaches the apostles, you have kind of the ping-pong of the complaint back to the church, who do you think should handle this? Right? And then you have the, um, the, the suggestions, the, the solve comes from the church back to the apostles, and then they lay hands on them, pray over them, and then they kind of commit them to the service. A very symbiotic, a very cool relationship that happens in the church. And why was this able to be done? Because they were able to get past the fact that there was a problem. For so many of us, we can't get past the fact that there's a problem. We can't give someone even the leeway, even just the general kindness or gentleness to even hear the problem out or to think we just, we just immediately, oh, the, you know what? You know what those fools did? You know what those genuine Jews did? They shorted our old ladies. They hate old women. They hate Jesus. They're, and we just, boom, blow it up in our minds and in those around us and we gossip and we complain and we trash and we do this. And then when the problem either gets worse or there's backlash because just as we've walked in the flesh, the people that we've accused walk in the flesh back at us, and you have this huge just meltdown and terribleness. Trust me, many, many, many splits. Many, many, many people that have left churches. This is exactly how it happens. And you could ask them, well, did you, did you talk to that person? Well, no. Why would I do that? Why would I talk to the person that has offended me? Why would I give them an opportunity to make it right? They offended me. They don't deserve an opportunity to make it right. It's just really, really weird pride that we have. I feel like I'm handing out and trying to dole out some spanking. I'm not. My heart here is not to be rude and be like, you guys are terrible, blah, blah, blah. You know, not, that's not my heart at all. My heart is that just to say, if you're like me, you observed in your own heart And in the hearts of others, and for me, I think it's just magnified because so much of our interaction now is public and online because of the coronavirus sheltering in place, because so much more dialogue is being done online and is public and is just written down forever. So much of that, we just see so much more. And we see just how anonymity, stress, loneliness, anger, fear, when those things pile up on us, that the fruit of those things that comes out mostly through our fingertips um, is, is astronomical and hurtful. So I'm not here to trash anyone. I'm not here to, to, to make fun of anyone. I'm just saying that these are things that I've observed over the years. You probably have too if, if you've been in a church for a long time, or maybe you've personally experienced them, but they're radically destructive and things don't have to go that way. And they're not the will of God that we've been given such a better way to deal with conflict, to deal, to deal with the oxen poo, such a better way to work and clean the, the stall, as it were. And it's love. And it's the Holy Spirit. And it's the fruit of that, which is patience, faithfulness. Not just faithfulness to Jesus, but also faithfulness through Jesus to others. 
that I can be I can be patient and just observe how these things that I can, you know, I can care, I can, I can withhold, I can, I don't have to lash out. That I can truly love. I was talking to Tam this morning uh, from my desk, and I was saying, man, I, I have forgotten how many passages end with love your enemy, love your brother, be nice to people, be kind to people. So I, I guess it's kind of become a, a burr in my own saddle for me personally. Um, if, if I were to talk about my own life in the lockdown and what I've realized, I think a lot of it is just personal pride. Uh, I've been taking a lot of walks in the morning just praying about like, Lord, forgive me for ever esteeming myself to be anything. I'm nothing. I just, I just want to be faithful to you. Lord, forgive me for ever wanting any kind of, any you know, to be something, to find identity, to attaboys or whatever it might be. Lord, forgive me for that. I just, I know in my own heart there is sin and badness. And if you're like me and you observe the things that I have, you know that, man, this is, this is a chronic problem in the church today. This is a chronic problem in Christians today. We, we have identities we were never supposed to have. We make comments on based in, we make actions based on identities we were never supposed to have. We disobey the simplest of God's commands, the, the pinnacle of God's commands, where Jesus even says that the whole of the law and the prophets, in other words, everything God ever wanted to say through the law and through the prophets is love God and love your neighbor. And we forget that, and instead it becomes whatever it becomes. It, it just, all the pursuits. It could be anything. It could be politics. It could be making sure the Constitution stands. It could be making sure that I have the most toys when I die. It could be making sure that you know, whatever it might be, that everybody knows that I'm the king of my castle. It could be making sure that I'm revered. It could be making sure that my church does everything right the way I think it is. All these different endeavors and identities that come out when the whole time Jesus is just saying, would you guys please just love each other, take care of each other, care for one another. And here this is this great thing. The complaint goes out, and a terrible complaint it is. I mean, if anything could split a church, I would think that if you want to call it racial or if you want to call it um, national, nationality-based discrimination against old women, not giving, denying them money or food, <laughs> if anything could split a church, I would think it could be that or it would be that. But it doesn't split. Instead, people stop they take a deep breath. They bring the problem to people they think that can help. Those people bring the problem to back to the church, at least the portion of the church that want to help. Those people put forward people that they believe will be valuable to help. And then those people actually walk in that ministry, endorsed by the leaders. And all of a sudden, that problem goes away. Because look at verse 7, And the word of God continued to increase. The Word of God continued to increase. When there are problems in the church, how many of us have witnessed or at least seen, I mean, or at least heard of, there's a big problem in the church, and what happens? The Word of God decreases. Oh, it may not decrease in its preaching. It may not decrease in the communication, but all of a sudden people can't hear it. They can't hear the word because the drums were too loud. They can't hear the word because the sanctuary is painted the wrong color. They can't hear the word because whatever it might be. All these reasons, are all of a sudden I just can't hear the word because of this problem. And sometimes it's a very legitimate problem. But in this case, the problem is solved and the result is this. The word of God grew and people heard it. And people were encouraged, and people were blessed, and great things came from it. And it's just wonderful. And how did it all happen? Because people just did what they were supposed to do, which is what? They walked with Jesus. They listened to the Holy Spirit. They listened to one another. They didn't deny things. They didn't try to get rid of things. They just acted like Christians are supposed to act. And it's such a... I think a glorious and a wonderful example of how the church can overcome adversity. There's a lot more that can be talked about here. There's a lot more uh, that can be addressed in um, uh, how they went about this and, and, and who these guys were. Uh, and it's, it's funny because these seven, they, they must become fairly unknown because way out in Acts 21, 
uh, they get referred back. They're talking about Philip, because Philip and Stephen, well, Stephen's going to be slain next chapter. He's going to be martyred. But Philip goes on to um, have a family, have this ministry, uh, talk to a, uh, he, he ends up being instrumental in the gospel going to Africa. I mean, just this really amazing ministry that comes from Philip. And so the seven are actually, in, verse, in, in chapter 21, it refers to uh, Philip, who was one of the seven. So uh, evidently, these, these people, we don't read about the other four, but these guys, they go on to um, really be a blessing to the church. It's also noteworthy that if you read these names and you were to look them up, these are all Greek names. These aren't names of Jews. They're Greek names. So the church raised up, evidently, Hellenistic Jews to help with this. And, it was, and who raised up the Hellenistic Jews? The Hebrew Jews, the disciples. And then who laid hands on them? The Hebrew Jews, the, the apostles. So I'm not saying that there weren't, gen, that there weren't Greek Jews that helped uh, in the disciples, but I'm saying that ultimately it was this mixed bag of, of Christians who were still identifying with wrong identities that brought these people to Hebrew Jews, the apostles, and that they were put forward as Greek Jews. So all of a sudden you just have this super amazing and super um, wonderful close to it. I think what we'll do, we'll turn to one last, just by, just by application, let's turn to one last verse. In First Peter, next week, um, next week we'll look at the qualifications. Uh, I was going to cover that, but we're, we're getting short on time. So next week, we'll, uh, God willing, we'll look at what it is it means to be of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. Um, and we can talk about how that came about in these guys' lives, and we can talk about where the fruit from that went, um, and even talk about, yeah, a lot. But in closing, if you wouldn't mind, uh, flip over to First Peter So in 1 Peter chapter 4, and this will just leave you with this challenge this week, and my, for myself included. The end of all things is at hand. Have you ever felt that way? <laughs> I mean, isn't that like half the YouTube videos that are getting circulated right now? Well, guess what? The end of all things have been at hand for 2,000 years. I'm not saying that to minimize it. I'm saying that we have lived in the church age awaiting Jesus' uh, uh, return, awaiting for him to rapture his church and then touch down later on, seven years later, at the Mount of Olives and judge the world. We've waited, we've waited for this for 2,000 years. We're going to continue to wait, but it doesn't change the fact that the end of all things is at hand. This is the, the end of all things. It's always the most important time, right? If you're watching a, a sports, if you watch football, they have a two-minute drill, and it's, this, it's the drill where they're trying to drive down the field as fast as they can to get a touchdown. No huddle, no this. Pull out all the stops. Get down there. If it's, you know, if it's baseball, you just turn your hat on inside out and a rally cap, and it's superstitious. But whatever sport it is, if it's hockey, they pull the goalie so they have another person out to, to try to get a goal so they don't lose. You know, and, and all the movies, right? Independence Day, you have a big speech, and then you go and fight the aliens. Or, and, and all this, it's, it's the end. It's the time to pour it all in. It's not the time to withhold. It's not the time to, to draw back. It's not the time to conserve. It's the, it's the time to give. The end of all things at hand, the most crucial time. Therefore, be self-controlled and be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And in this case, he says, look, because it's the end of all things, be self-controlled and sober. In other words, exercise the control that God has given you. Don't be given to other things. Don't be given to other causes. Don't be given to, no, be given to the cause of the kingdom. Have your life poured out for what Christ is building, not what human beings are building. Then he says, be sober-minded. Now, this doesn't mean somber-minded. I say that a lot, but it's important because a lot of times when we translate sober, for some of us, when we translate the word sober into our mind, we actually translate it somber. The idea that we're supposed to be like, well, gosh, I hope this works out. Everything stinks. It's the last time. That's how what I do naturally. But that's not, we're not to be somber. We're to be sober. What's being sober? It's the opposite of drunk. It's the idea of being well thought. It's the idea of paying attention. It's about being, uh, having your faculties 
Sober-minded means that you're exercising the faculties of your mind. Knowledge, wisdom, uh, you know, managing emotions, managing uh, thought processes and how we look at things. We're being sober about things. What does this mean? What should I do here? We're not reacting, right? Self-control and sober for the sake of your prayers. Why? Because if you're all willy-nilly, if you're just reacting and angry and fearful and giving into those things, if you're not using your mind and, and your faculties to make decisions and to consider, your prayers get crazy. Your prayers can go, or you just don't pray at all because you have nothing to say. And you just, he says, look, for the sake of being able to intercede to the eternal God by the eternal spirit to exercise God's power upon the earth for his kingdom, be sober, be self-controlled. Verse eight, above all. So he says, hey, the end of all time is at hand. We should be self-controlled. We should be sober. We should be praying. But above all, above that, I love that term, above all. I just want to keep saying it. Above all. Above politics? Yep. Above personal feelings? Yep. Above what I want? Yep. Above how I, I, I want to treat people or how mad I am? Yep. Above all. Keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins. Keep loving one another earnestly. Keep doing that. Isn't it interesting? Clearly, love is not a feeling. Love can have feelings, but it's not conglomerated. It's not condensed to a feeling. Love is something more than that because I can keep doing it, and I can do it earnestly. I can do it in my thoughts. When I want to rage because I hate somebody's philosophy on the coronavirus, when I want to rage because I hate somebody's politics, when I want to rage because I hate whatever, Whatever, the car they drive, <laughs> some comment they made, that I can actually stop in that moment and say, Lord, this is not of you. My hatred is not of you. My unbridled wrath is not of you. Lord, you love that person. You want the best for that person. You want to bless that person. I can love them too. Lord, would you, I can walk down the street. Lord, would you bless that person? Lord, would you do great things for that person? Lord, would you bring them to yourself? Would you do whatever it takes in their life so they will decide to trust you? Lord, will you bless their ministry? Lord, will you use them for great things? All of a sudden, I can move out of a self-centered location in my heart and life and move forward because that's what I'm supposed to do above everything. You know what's more important about the right coronavirus path is loving all the people in the path. You know what's more important about setting people straight on Facebook is loving the people that you think might need to, or I think might need to be set straight. To care for them. A deep, centered, godly care for them. It says, I want the best for you. I'm not upset because what you said. I'm upset because what you said, I believe, could harm you. And I don't want you to be harmed. I want you to have the best that God has for you. I want you to have the best that this life could give you, in, as it is God's will. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm never going to I'm never going to make a comment on any post. I'm never going to call someone. I'm never going to text someone anything unless it's for the reason that I want the best for them. I want to I want to love them. I'm texting you right now and it may be a hard word, but I want you to know I love you. And I want to text you this so that you can know that there's great things for you. Not snarky, rude. I want to draw you down and let you know how stupid you are. That's not God. That's Satan. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And you can know if you're out there accusing your brethren, if you're out there hating and, and waging war against brethren, you are doing the work of Satan. I would be doing the work of Satan. And again, that's not a spanking. That's not anger. That's like, let's get our priorities straight. The kingdom is at hand. The last days are here. The end is at hand. He says, man, keep loving each other. It covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that what we want? Don't we want our sins to be covered? Isn't that, the, isn't that the, really one of the base desires of every human being on the planet? To have sin covered? You know, it's funny because we rarely, we, we rarely just expose ourselves of our sin. Well, probably physically too, but we rarely... We rarely do those things. Rarely is our status update 
I am a radically pompous, hateful, lustful, self-centered, disgusting, hearted human being. I manipulate people to get what I want. I say things in conversations when I know that I'm wrong, but I still want to just win. I try, I, I sit in my room and I covet things all the time. I neglect things I probably should do. I've, I've, there's been times in my life where I haven't helped people because I didn't want to get off my couch, right? We, that's not ever our status updates because we want sin to be covered. And so here is P uh, Peter writing to the, the church in this last time, this time of radical persecution, still trying to figure out how things work. I mean, all the, all the problems the church has always had. And he says, guys, guys, make sure you love each other. Make sure you take care of each other. That's the next thing he's going to say, verse 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Be hospitable. Right now, that's difficult. And hospitality can be, yes, having people over for dinner, but hospitality also just extends to our conversation. You can have a hospitable conversation instead of just we trying to destroy or crush or this. Why do you feel that way? Why are you so upset about that? Why don't you tell me about what's going on in your life? How did you get to the place where you're at? Can I pray for you? I'm sorry you've gone through that hurt. We can be hospitable in our Facebook comments, in our texting, in all these ways. Be hospitable to one another. Love one another. Verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's very grace. The King James says God's manifold grace. And the manifold, and you've probably heard that. Maybe you've heard about that on a car. You have like an intake manifold or an exhaust manifold. And what a manifold is, it's, it's just something that takes... So, you know, one hole, right? In the case of an intake, it's one hole where all the air and fuel comes in, and then it disperses it to all the different cylinders in your engine. That's what a manifold is. It's something that takes one and disperses it into many. So the manifold grace of God is the idea of God's grace flowing out by His Holy Spirit, and then it's given in different tubes, in different ways, in different times to different people. So he says, we have a manifold grace. Each one of us has been given gifts, and we ought to be a good steward of that gift. If we're out trashing people, if we're out hating and, and devouring one another, we're not being good stewards. We're being bad stewards. Because God has given you grace to bless and to lift up and to do great things in and for his kingdom. We don't want to be detractors from that. God forbid that he should come back or that we should be raptured and meet him in the clouds and we were a detractor from God's people. Sometimes I wonder at the things that I've said and the things that I've observed or listened to other people say. And I think to myself, did I really think that Jesus was going to high five me for trashing someone else? I mean, like, you know, for example, I was thinking about this the other day. We can be so susceptible to people that have really large ministries to publicly trashing them and, and, and to make little public posts of, well, this big time pastor did this or this big time pastor did that. Can you imagine? Like, and what I was thinking of is this. Um, I was thinking to myself, could I imagine if one of these huge, you know, 10,000 person church, multi million person, person, online presence, guys, said, you know what? James Aiken in Long Beach, Washington is a pile of garbage and his doctrine is garbage. Can I imagine what would happen? And then all of a sudden my puny little uh, uh, YouTube channel that I actually don't even monitor, I probably have like 10 subscribers, <laughs> right? My, pu my pathetic little channel. And then all of a sudden, just comments start coming kind of rolling in. You suck. You're terrible. Kill yourself. You're serving Satan. Your doctrine is wrong. You're garbage. You're this. Could I imagine if that? And it was a horrible thought to me. We feel justified to just shoot things out there into internet land because they're big time and they're this and they're that or whatever. But it's ludicrous. The scale on which the church has decided to kick God's commandment of loving one another to the curb is astronomical. And I, for one, am in a coming to a place for my own heart. My own, I don't, I, I'm not shocked that nobody wants to go to church. Because if that's what I thought church was, I wouldn't go either. 
Why would I want to go to a place where there's a bunch of infighting, bickering? Where they can't even agree on how to, how to do a, a, a virus. They can't even agree to disagree on that. They can't even agree to disagree on how a person gets saved. They can't even agree to disagree on whether or not there should be drums or, or guitar or hymns or what a worship sh should be like. Why, why would I go take place in that? Where's life in that? Where's love in that? Jesus is a God of love. I hate that church because blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's ridiculous, friends. But here we're, he says, look, love Show hospitality. Use your gift. Be a good steward of God's grace. And he says, whoever serves, serves by the strength that God supplies. It's not, we don't serve and do because of how great we are or what we have. We pray and say, God, what do you have for me? And then we serve going forward on that. There's a lot more to be said about that. But, and he goes on to say, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To, belong, to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever and amen. You know, we need to kind of check ourselves because the reason we're doing what we're doing is to give glory to Jesus Christ. So if we think that trashing one another, whether it's in a small group or it's a private conversation or whether it's publicly or whether it's internet, if we think that trashing one another that Jesus is going to come back and we're going to stand before him and he's going to say, oh, James, I was so glad that you trashed my servant so-and-so over and over again. I was so glad that you put on the internet what a piece of garbage you thought the governor was. I was just so glad that you trashed this person that I loved and gave my blood for. I, me and the Father, we were so thankful. I fived the Holy Spirit. I was like, thank God for my faithful servants. They're willing to just absolutely trash my creation. I'm just so excited. It's ridiculous. I don't think it's going to be that way at all. I don't think we're going to get high fives for all the people we made fun of. I don't think we're going to get high fives for all the, all the big ministry guys that maybe made a mistake, maybe didn't say something the way we would say. I don't even think we'd get high fives for calling out public people that were saying things that were wrong. I don't think Jesus is going to come back and be like, yeah, I hated those guys too. <sighs> so glad that you did that. I, I just, I don't believe it's going to be that way. I believe we have one calling and it's to love. And to speak the truth in love. And that's what we're here to do. As Christians, as believers, whether it's the coronavirus or whether we, when it's we can get together, there are always going to be problems at the church. There will always be ox and poo to deal with. Always. But you know what? Let's deal with it like they did. Let's come to one another. Get advice from one another. Let's pray together. Let's seek for reconciliation. Let's do it in love. And, and let's see the church heal and grow and, and great things come of that. We have the most powerful, powerful thing in the universe. We have God. And we have Jesus, God come in flesh, who forgave our sins at Calvary. And we have the Holy Spirit who indwells us as believers. We have so much to do so much with, to see such good and such light pierce through this dark world. Let's not get dragged down by the things of this life. Things that don't matter. Things that are temporal. And, and let's instead walk with what God has for us. And I want to encourage you, wherever you're at today, if you're watching this and you made it to the end and you don't know Jesus Christ, you know what? Christians, we're, we're a bunch of baddies. Don't look at us right now. Look at Jesus. Jesus loves you. Jesus paid for your sins. Jesus wants to do something great. And you can receive that by crying out to Him. And I just want to invite you now to ask him into your heart, if that's where you're at right now. And say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord Jesus, please forgive my sins. Lord Jesus, please fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to know this love. I want to know this truth. And you'll never be disappointed. And he says that when, you, when a person asks him that, that he wipes away every sin, past, present, and future, gives you a destiny, Romans 8, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that you have such, such great things ahead of you by simply putting your trust in Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian today, I challenge you, if you're trashing people, please stop. Please stop doing that. Just love people. And you say, well, I don't know how to love people when I disagree with them. We can start with just not, not disagreeing with them. We can start with praying through our decisions and our words, exercising sober thought processes, exercising self-controlled thought processes, 
before we respond to people that we disagree with. We can start with praying for the people that we disagree with. We can start with thinking, if I was being, if somebody thought wrong of what I thought, what would I want them to do? How would I want them to be treated? What would help me come to the right way of thinking? And then in things where, quite honestly, I don't know about you, but when I read the news, this scientist says this, this scientist says this, this news anchor says this, this news anchor says that, this doctor says this, this doctor says this, this constitutional expert says this, this constitutional expert says this, and they're all different. I don't know if you've noticed that. There's a million things out there that are different. And so I, I don't know. Maybe that what the doctors say and all, it doesn't need to be our hope. Maybe our hope can just be what Jesus says. And our interaction can be based on what Jesus says. And regardless of what the coronavirus will or won't do, regardless of what the economy... Guess what? If the economy globally collapses and we're starving, guess what will happen? We'll get together and we'll make stone soup. And each person will bring their little snap pea and throw it in some water. And we'll make soup together. And then all of a sudden we won't be able to visa our way out of our problems. We won't be able to go down and refi. We won't be able to, no, we'll actually have to like really trust God, <laughs> which I'm not saying you don't right now. I'm not, please don't take inverses of what I'm saying. I'm saying that it would bring revival to the church like never before. Faith would be exercised like never before in our time in America. I praise God for America. I praise God for what we have and, and being able to have a house and food and warmth and all those things. Praise God for that. But I want to say like Paul, that I can be abased, I can have nothing, or I can abound. That I can, I can walk with Jesus, and that I too want to be so like him in his death, that his life could be shown out of me. That I could really be a place in my life where I can go hungry and rejoice, and just say, God, you're so good. It doesn't matter what I had for dinner, or if I didn't have dinner, you're still good. That I could get to a place like Job, whose wife in all the difficulty said, Job, just curse God and die, man. Just be done. This is ridiculous. You've been hosed by God. And his response is, look, if he slays me, if God kills me, if he reaches down from heaven and takes my life from me, I'll trust him with that. Because he's that great. And he's that powerful. And he knows so well. And I'm me. And I'm broken. Let's humble ourselves. And let's love each other and take steps to do it at every opportunity. So if you feel like I was trying to trash people today, I'm not. I'm really not. My wife always tells me, James, you just get too passionate sometimes. And that may be true. It probably is true. But my passion is, let's heal, church. Let's heal. My passion is not to down anybody. or condemn. I don't have any condemnation. I have no condemnation for people that are saying the worst things on the internet. I'm not condemning you today because Jesus isn't condemning you today if you're a believer in Jesus. I'm just saying, let's change. And let's look at and be honest about what the problem is in the church today universally. And let's change. And let's instead move to a place where we say, you know what? We're going to walk with God and let the chips fall where they may. And, and, and we're going to let the government do what the government's going to do. And we're going to just do what Jesus wants us to do. And the fallout from that for us will be life. And for others also, the word of God will grow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the examples of these saints of old that didn't do everything right. Factions that shouldn't have been factions. Traditions that maybe needed to go away. A church that was still trying to figure things out and wasn't perfect. Whether it be the early, the beginning church, or whether it's Corinth, Lord, you've always had grace for every one of us and kindness and forgiveness and life, and power. And we just pray that we would, as the end of all things is here, we would love one another with a true, deep-felt reality of love, that agape love, that, that moral love that desires the best for every person, regardless of creed, or politic, or whatever, or background. May we be those that can look on the greatest sinner, or the greatest saint, and just say, I love you. May we be those that are versed and understand and are sober-minded, self-controlled to be able to give your truth to people in love. And then when we don't know the complete truth, when we don't know everything, to just be able to back away and pray. Help us to be builders of your holy kingdom. And Lord, I pray today for people that might have been offended. I pray that you comfort them. I pray that they would know your heart, my own. And I pray, Lord, that we would not be offended by your word, 
but that instead we would embrace and allow you to change us. Lord, help us to navigate these crazy times with crazy decisions that have to be made. Help us to honor you in the way that you desire to be honored and not just the best way we think you should be honored. Lord, help us to do your will. We ask for your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen.